Okay. Okay, so let's uh let's see. Where are we now? Okay. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat window on the Hi Christoph. Hello, who was that? Christoph. The other Christoph. Oh hi. <laughs> other Christoph. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Good to see you again. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's uh, somewhat uh, unusual circumstances, but um, great that it well, worked it's out. The, anyway. the new normal. Let's 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 get yeah. used to it. <laughs> as much as possible, I suppose. What do they say in um, Michigan? Are you going? To, are they are they talking about classes in the fall? How they are going to happen? Yeah, I think it's unclear at the moment what is going yeah. to happen. Um, yeah. Everything certainly has been online for some time, but uh, when and under what circumstances um, things will start again is very unclear. So people are preparing to have extended online time, I think. How is it at USC? Yeah, they, I don't know. Today we got a memo that they think that maybe some of the classes will be able to meet on campus. I see. But, uh, you know, um, we'll see. Maybe what they will do is that they will have uh, subsets of the class alternating in the classroom and then the rest following on, uh, on the internet. I see. So fitting in as many as possible with... Um, well, I mean, fitting uh, fewer people so that the classes are not... Uh, so they can spread out in the classroom. Right, right. They still all have to come in through one door, right? They have to yeah. come in through one door, and they and they sit in the building, uh, which is air conditioned throughout. So and touch everything. Ah. And touch everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess the the better the vent and um, air ducts are, the more people get to share everything with each other. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we have okay. quite. Okay. So uh, let's see, what time is it? Um, oh, actually, it's still time. It's still, uh, it's only just past 12.15. So maybe uh, we'll wait a couple more minutes and then we'll begin. Um, and uh, uh, just, um, you know, because traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Speed of light, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh wow! Um, I, you know, my my optimistic take on this, and I, I'm, I'm sure uh, many others are saying this now, is that will when we come out of all of this, I think some some aspects of the things we've learned in doing this will 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 hopefully persist, because I, I think many of us have always thought it would be useful to be able to do some component of online stuff, some reduction in having to fly across the planet to give a talk and then come back or what have you for no, for no really good reason. Um, and while there's you know, no substitute for actually meeting face to face and brainstorming and stuff like that, that doesn't always happen to at some of the conferences we go to. And so I think being able to do some online stuff as a matter of routine and cut down on carbon emissions and stuff like that. I, I actually think uh, it, it, it's going to be a good thing. And in the past, it was hard to get people to do that, do it because they go, oh, the technology doesn't work. And now I think we've all learned, actually, we just needed to spend more than more than five minutes playing with it. And then actually it works pretty well. And now I've jinxed this entire seminar. <laughs> <laughs> now we're, now we're going to have well, technical I'm... difficulties every five minutes. <laughs> But I, I think uh, I'm having my think, fingers crossed here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to shut up now and uh, let you um, take over. So uh, let me just say it's a, it's a pleasure, uh, uh, Christoph, uh, to to have you join us here at USC in this uh, in this manner, and welcome to everybody from uh, well, lots of other places. We've thirty thirty four people. Um, uh, joining us so far, and uh, you're very welcome. And we will go for approximately an hour, and then I'll try and moderate some questions for another 10 or 15 minutes after that, if needed. And 
hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that. If you want, Christoph, uh, you can also pop up the, the chat screen in case people want to ask you questions that way. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try and uh, see how we go. Okay. Um, and uh, if, if need be, someone can also just sort of jump in with audio. But if that gets a little too crowded in terms of the sound channel, I might just mute everybody and uh, let Christoph continue um, if it gets too, uh, too, too noisy. Okay, and let me remind everyone by default, if you keep your microphone muted, that'll be helpful to everybody. Okay, so uh, welcome, uh, Christoph Ullermann, um, who's now at um, uh, University of Michigan, the theory group there. And he's gonna tell us about Wilson loops in 5D long quiver gauge theories. All right, thank you very much uh, for having me. to in the somewhat um, unusual circumstances. And uh, thanks everyone uh, for tuning in. Um, what I want to talk about today um, is some work in progress, uh, which is in the broad theme of exploring a class of five dimensional superconformal field theories that arise from um, gauge theories of long quiver types, meaning with uh, many gauge nodes. Um, the talk will have sort of a field theory part to it and an ADS CFT part to it. Uh, the field theory part is based um, on some localization uh, computation uh, results uh, that you can find in this reference down here uh, and earlier works. And uh, the supergravity part will be based on some solutions that I will uh, introduce somewhere along the way. Um, but maybe to get uh, sort of everyone into the right mindset, uh, I want to start by recalling and bringing up some uh, of the facts that uh, are interesting about quantum field theories in higher dimensions. Uh, the first one certainly is that it's uh, notoriously hard to define interacting quantum field theories in dimensions greater than uh, four perturbatively, um, just because there are no suitable renormalizable interactions. In particular, if I write down a gauge theory, it has uh, a, coupling cons a coupling of a negative mass dimension and naively at best makes sense um, as, a low, as a low energy effective field theory. So with that background, it's certainly a remarkable and interesting that um, based uh, to a large extent uh, on insights from string theory, we now firmly believe that they are interacting and UV complete non-gravitational quantum field theories uh, in five and six dimensions. Uh, and this makes these theories quite interesting to look at. Uh, but they are not just mathematical curiosities, they also play sort of an important role in the general understanding of quantum field theories. Uh, and this is in part due to the fact that uh, theories in higher dimensions are fairly tightly constrained. Uh, this starts with the available uh, super algebras for supersymmetric theories, uh, which brings classification attempts within reach. And also each one of these higher dimensional theories, once I have it, um, is a seed for many, many lower dimensional theories that I can get out of it upon compactification. And this way one can obtain uh, fairly non-trivial insights also into lower dimensional theories, uh, ranging from studying interesting dualities between field theories uh, to the construction of altogether new theories. Uh, there are many examples of that. So in this little picture, which I'm showing here uh, as sort of um, a cartoon, the upper part of the stream, which may or may not be somewhere in Michigan, um, the upper part sort of where things flow somewhat orderly and are fairly constrained represents the higher dimensional field theories. And as I go down in dimensions, things open up, get more broad and maybe more fuzzy, uh, but I can certainly um, deduce what's going on down here to extent by understanding the upper part of the stream uh, where things are a bit more constrained. So hopefully um, this gives a bit of a motivation for looking at higher dimensional quantum field theories. Um, a treat in five dimensions actually is that a uh, fairly conventional effect of field theory goes a pretty long way uh, in the sense that many of the um, five dimensional super quantum field theories that we believe exist 
um, arise directly from uh, non renormalizable gauge theories that flow to strongly coupled UV fixed points and by that uh, becoming strongly coupled, uh, the problems with non renormalizability. Um, the half of this um, sort of picture is part uh, in a field. This is the dynamics of supersymmetric gauge theories on their Coulomb branches, and is backed up on the other end by string theory and M theory uh, constructions. What we get out of this um, is a coherent picture of evidence uh, for the existence of um, strongly coupled five dimensional superconformal field theories. Um, they are isolated in the sense that they have no supersymmetric marginal deformations. Um, but nevertheless, into many of, for many of them, we can get access at least to certain features uh, by studying supersymmetric gauge theories. Um, so this on the one hand gives a handle to studying these theories. On the other hand, the UV fixed points often exhibit um, qualitatively new features, uh, things like enhanced symmetries, enhanced scaling behaviors, and often remarkable dualities. So this is certainly an interesting, uh, interesting class of theories um, to study. Now, what I want to talk about um, today are not sort of the most general five-dimensional gauge theories, but a particular class of them. And what I want to look at um, are linear curve gauge theories, uh, where I will assume that all the nodes uh, are SUN gauge nodes, the string of such gauge nodes. Um, I may comment on generalizations later, but for now they're SUN. Um, and for each of these gauge nodes, I may or may not have John Simon's terms associated with them. Uh, they are connected by bifundamental hypermultiplets, and I may have additional fundamental uh, hypermultiplets attached to them. Now, the reason these theories are interesting is that uh, on the one hand, Many of these theories um, flow to strongly coupled uh, superconformal field theories in the ultraviolet, so they make sense as well defined coupled field theories. And uh, in certain large n limits, which I will explain in a little more detail, uh, they have holographic duals. The UV fixed points of these gauge theories uh, have holographic duals uh, in type 2b supergravity, and this allows for um, a fruitful interplay. Uh, between quantum field theory uh, and string theory methods in analyzing the dynamics of these theories. And this is, of course, the theme uh, for what I, want, what I want to talk about today. And I want to focus on um, basically the sphere partition functions and based on that, um, then analyze Wilson loops. All right, so this is sort of um, the class of theories I'm interested in. Uh, the outline for the talk is that uh, I will have well, mainly two parts. The first one is uh, using field theory um, methods to uh, analyze, as I uh, mentioned, the sphere partition functions and Wilson loops. And then the second part, I want to sort of um, uh, change gears and go to a string theory and ADS CFT picture, uh, which is somewhat complementary and in which the results obtained from these localization computations have somewhat interesting um, interpretations and offer some interesting prospects uh, that I wanted to advertise. Okay, but let's start uh, with the localization part. Um, instead of sort of looking at the most general uh, um, linear quiver gauge theory uh, that I can cover, I want to introduce um, three simple examples of these theories, uh, discuss them in a little bit of detail, and maybe comment on uh, generalization wherever it makes sense or it seems appropriate. So the first theory I want to talk about, uh, I'll call it TN theories. It's a string of SU gauge nodes starting at SU2, represented by these circular nodes, all the way up to SUN. And at both ends, the string of gauge nodes is terminated um, by fundamental hypermultiplets, and on the right end, and two on the left end. Uh, the reason these theories are called TN is that upon uh, compactification to four dimensions, they're reduced to the four dimensional TN theories. So that makes them interesting to study. And we have a few things to say about that. Uh, the YN theories have a somewhat similar form. I again start out with, with SUN, SU2 gauge nodes, go up all the way to SUN minus one. Then there is an SUN node, uh, which has a Chern-Simons term to it. 
And from there, it goes back down all the way to ST2. And at both ends, I have uh, two fundamental uh, hypermultiplets attached to the boundary gauge nodes here. Uh, the name for this theory will be explained later. And the same is true for the plus theories, which are perhaps the easiest to explain. They're just a string of SUN gauge nodes, uh, M minus one of them. And to both um, ends, they are terminated by uh, N fundamental hypermultiples. So there are some common features that one can um, see already in these examples. Uh, one of them is that the rank of the gauge groups changes quote unquote continuously. By that I mean it, it changes by order one numbers as I move along the quiver. They don't have to be one like in this case, but it is some number which does not scale uh, with n. Um, and that is true for all of these theories. Uh, they also have at almost all nodes an effective number of flavors. By that I mean uh, possible flavors, fundamental flavors that are attached and also counting by fundamentals with adjacent gauge nodes. At almost all nodes, they have an effective number of flavors, which is twice the number of copies. So for example, for this SU3 gauge node here, I have two by fundamentals to the left, four to the right, meaning uh, I get six flavors in total, uh, which is twice the number of copies. So these nodes would be in conformal in four dimensions, but this does not need to be the case for all nodes. For example, at the central node here, I have n minus one nodes uh, to both sides. So this node certainly has a number of flavors, which is smaller than 2n, and the boundary nodes actually have an excess compared to that. It's also true that um, all of these theories do not have dimensionless coupling parameters, being five-dimensional gauge theories, um, but they all flow to strongly coupled uh, superconformal field theories in the ultraviolet. They also, all three of them, have holographic duals. Um, for that uh, to be useful, I want some sort of um, um, double scaling limit. Uh, and in the absence of dimensionless coupling constants, uh, that does not involve the coupling constant. But I still have, for all of these theories, two parameters that can be, uh, that can be scaled. This is perhaps most clearly visible for the plus theories. Um, where I can independently scale the rank of the gauge groups to be large, uh, and I can scale the length of the quiver to be large. And the regime in which this theory will have a holographic dual is when both of these parameters are large. Similarly, for the TN and the YN theories, um, which in fact only have one parameter, so it controls both of these uh, um, features of the theories, but they also at large N lead to um, gauge theories with some large rank gauge nodes, not necessarily all of them, but some of them are large, and um, also I have a long quiver gauge theory. So these are the three example theories uh, that I want to look at, and I want to discuss for them um, what kinds of uh, observables we can compute in, uh, in the field theory, in particular Wilson lines. All right, so the um, uh, technical tool to do these computations, of course, is supersymmetric localization. And it turns out that uh, localization computations for these theories are uh, somewhat interesting. So I want to explain uh, a bit from a broad perspective what is interesting about them and how they work. Uh, so the level at which I want to talk about it is that supersymmetric localization is um, a tool to reduce um, the path integral, for example, for the partition function in the sphere. Uh, to a matrix integral um, over constant values uh, for an adjoint scalar in the vector multiplet or alternatively over the uh, Coulomb branch. So I get to replace this path integral by an integral over one matrix. And these matrix models, of course, um, can often be solved uh, exactly using saddle point techniques at large n um, in many, many examples. What's interesting about the long quiver gauge theories is that if I have an order n number of gauge nodes in some form of a large n limit, uh, is that I have, of course, also an order n number of adjoint scalars associated with the um, uh, gauge fields for each gauge node. And that way I get basically many, many matrices. So what I get out of the localization procedure is sort of a multi-matrix integral 
we have a large number of matrices that are being integrated over and in the integrand these matrices are all actually coupled to each other um, due to the presence of the bifundamental hypermultiplets uh, that link adjacent gauge nodes. So these are somewhat non-standard matrix models. Uh, the saddle point equations are a long list of equations that, um, uh, that are coupled. And uh, so in a first attempt uh, with Martin Fluder, we sort of looked at these matrix models uh, using uh, numerical techniques, uh, which allowed us to um, get predictions for the free energies on the sphere and get some very accurate matches to ideas CFT predictions. Uh, and that, of course, then um, prompts for uh, a more analytic approach. And that is what I basically want to introduce briefly now. The details can be found uh, in this later reference down here. And, and uh, that's what I want to get into a little bit now. So the analytic solution of these matrix models uh, is based on an effectively continuous description for these um, long quiver gauge theories. Uh, I basically want to, in the first step, introduce a continuous coordinate on this quiver and replace uh, the, con the discrete variable which labels which gauge node I'm looking at um, by a continuous coordinate Z which takes values uh, on the interval zero, one. And at large L, when the length of this quiver becomes large, this is an effectively continuous uh, parameter. And I can sort of collect the data that characterizes this quiver gauge theory, the ranks of the gauge functions, for example, uh, in functions of this continuous coordinate. So I get this rank function N of C here. And likewise, I get uh, functions encoding uh, the flavors that may be attached to nodes and the churn Simons levels. Okay, so with this kind of uh, formulation for this kind of language for describing these quivers, I can then also characterize a little bit more accurately uh, what kind of quiver theories I'm looking at. Um, for the quivers uh, that we had as example, in all cases, uh, n of z is a piecewise linear and concave function uh, with churn simons terms and fundamental flavors only allowed at the points where n of z has um, kinks. So I will sometimes with a slight abuse of notation um, denote by n of z this rank function and by n the rank of some particular gauge groups. Um, I hope that will be clear from the context. Um, but in any case, these constraints which I've been uh, mentioning here uh, basically um, implement conditions that guarantee that these quivers float to strongly coupled um, UV fixed points and are well-defined. Okay, so this is sort of um, the uh, continuum description of the quiver gauge theories. If I now feed this into the matrix integrals, I do the usual uh, song and dance of replacing the matrices I'm integrating over by the eigenvalues, and then uh, in the large n limit, introduce um, an eigenvalue distribution for each gauge node, which uh, encodes the, the, the eigenvalues, and I'll do that um, for gauge groups with large rank, as well as gauge groups with uh, small rank, uh, where of course this is a bit of a questionable approximation, but it will turn out that this gives reasonable results and works out pretty well. So this far is basically uh, where you get, uh, where this is very similar to short quiver gauge theories or to single node theories, uh, but now it makes sense to take this family of eigenvalue distributions and replace it by one single function uh, of two uh, continuous parameters, one of them being um, the coordinate on the quiver and the other one, the uh, eigenvalues that I care for. So this is sort of the, uh, the notation the machinery that one needs. If you feed that into the, uh, into the matrix integrals uh, and massage it to get out the saddle point equations, it turns out uh, for one thing, that the eigenvalues typically scale with the length of the quiver, and then the um, saddle point equations very nicely turn into an electrostatics problem for this one function of two variables. Um, so for each quiver uh, and its particular features, I get one electrostatics uh, problem, where roughly I have some sort of cavity with um, the boundary conditions are imposed uh, at the endpoints of the quiver, depending on how many flavors there may be. Um, 
fundamental flavors that are attached um, show up as point charges in this electrostatics problem and at nodes where the number of flavors is less than twice the number of colors I get conducting plates that are being inserted uh, whose shape and form depends on whether or not I have Jim Simons terms uh, and such features of the quiver gauge theory. So in summary one can say that the eigenvalues of these multi-matrix models uh, at large n um, collectively behave as an electrostatics potential. Uh, we know how to construct electrostatics potentials and that allows to get um, a host of exact results uh, for fi these five-dimensional superconformal field theories that arise from uh, gauge theories. So let me look at the examples uh, for the plus theory. Uh, the rank function is just simply a constant, this being constant rank gauge nodes all through the quiver. And um, in the uh, electrostatics problem, uh, the flavors at the ends of the quiver show up in, term, in the form of boundary condition. Uh, this is the saddle point eigenvalue distribution on this axis going um, diagonally downwards here is the quiver, quiver node, the gauge node label, and in this direction on the parameter characterizing the eigenvalues. At the ends of the quiver, uh, at both ends, the eigenvalue distributions collapse to delta functions, so all eigenvalues are forced to zero there, but in between they spread out and actually these, distri these eigenvalue distributions for each fixed z have non-compact support. So this is sort of the general features of the eigenvalue distributions and once I have them, I can then compute the, uh, the, the free energy on the sphere. One can see that um, the scaling is enhanced uh, from n squared times m, the length of the quiver, which I would expect that weak coupling to n squared m squared. And this uh, whole result uh, gives an exact match um, to an ADS CFT prediction, so that certainly gives some confidence uh, that this procedure works uh, the way it is supposed to. Um, for the TN theory, uh, the rank function is a simple linear function starting out at zero on one end and going all the way up to n. Um, the eigenvalue distribution now has a delta function on one end corresponding to these n um, hypermultiplets here and spreads out into the rest of this um, of this space. And if we compute the free energy from this eigenvalue distribution, there's again an enhancement happening from n cubed to n to the four, and the result precisely again matches to an ADS safety prediction. All right, it gets a little more interesting for the YN theories, uh, where we have a central node that has um, less than uh, twice the number of colors as flavors. The rank function is piecewise linear again. It goes up from zero to n and then goes back down to zero. And what this shows up in the eigenvalue distributions uh, is as a, as a branch cut at the central node. Uh, it's one-sided due to the uh, Chern Simons term. Uh, so the eigenvalue distribution at the central node has bounded support in this direction, but otherwise they are just uh, of qualitatively similar formats for the plus and TN theories. And of course, once again, um, the free energy uh, result matches the ADS CFT prediction. Okay. Um, I good. Um, so this is as far as free energies are concerned. I'm trying a little bit because I'm seeing, I seem to be having some technical problems if I break off um, please let me know. Um, so this is as far as the free energies are concerned. Um, there are certainly lots of interesting physics in them which one could uh, discuss, but here I want to take them as a sort of stepping stone um, to study um, sort of more refined observables which probe in a little more detail the individual field theories. And these observables of course are um, Wilson lines. Um, in a quiver theory with many, many gauge nodes, I can think of a large variety uh, of Wilson line operators, which are in, um, which can be in non-trivial representations with respect to each of the gauge nodes. But I want to focus here on uh, Wilson line. Um, so I um, take them to transform trivially with respect to all but one gauge node. 
and they are then characterized by this particular, by the label for this gauge node and by representation. Uh, they are constructed in a similar way to uh, Wilson lens in many other dimensions. Uh, I take the gauge field and the real scalar and the vector multiplet uh, in combination to produce a supersymmetric operator. And if I place such a Wilson uh, loop on a great circle of S5, it is indeed um, half BPS. Um, and can be studied using supersymmetric um, localization. So what I need to do to compute the expectation value for this Wilson um, loop operator is to insert it into the path integral. And in the localization computation, that boils down to such a simple exponential factor here that's being introduced into the matrix model. Uh, and for small enough representations, um, this factor has no effect on the saddle point uh, equations. It does not back react, quote unquote. Uh, and for that reason, I can compute the expectation value simply by evaluating uh, this factor on the saddle point eigenvalue distribution. So that's what I want to do. Um, the natural first um, example to look at is the fundamental representation where I literally simply get the sum over the eigenvalues in this exponential here. Uh, and in the continuum formulation, I take this electrostatics potential, which encodes the eigenvalue distributions, evaluate it at the node corresponding to this Wilson line, uh, and it is integrated with an exponential factor here. And this actually brings about a sort of puzzle already, um, and that comes about as follows. Uh, if I look at this um, expression for the expectation value, uh, the scaling of this expectation value is determined by the largest eigenvalue uh, of the saddle point configuration. And this is not a very well-defined concept uh, when I have eigenvalue distributions that have unbounded support. Um, so from this sort of intuitive largest eigenvalue argument, one can maybe understand these integrals in general are just not well-defined, um, regardless of how quickly this eigenvalue distribution may fall off uh, as x goes to infinity. This exponential has an L in there, which is large and just ultimately offsets whatever fall off there may be. So that means these uh, expectation values can only be computed for a very small set of nodes, typically some order one number of nodes where the eigenvalue distributions have um, bounded support. And we can look at the three example theories. Uh, for the TN theories, uh, the only node that suggests itself is the one at the boundary where there were n flavors. It's a delta function here, so the Wilson loop expectation value is trivial. And the same is true for the plus NN theories, where now on both ends I get a Wilson loop that's um, uh, well defined to compute this way, um, but it's, it has a trivial expectation value. Uh, for the YN theories, it's a little more interesting. There was the one central node which had a Chu and Simons term. In that case, again, I can compute the expectation value. Uh, and it actually shows some non trivial scaling. I get this factor 8 to the 2n here, um, which is uh, uh, non trivial. Um, so, this is perhaps not quite what one was hoping for. It's not the large uh, set of Wilson loop operators, but it's a non trivial set of predictions, uh, nevertheless. Um, and I should point out that uh, typically these gauge theories are not quite as boring as the TN and plus theories in that regard. Uh, there typically is some order one uh, fraction of nodes for which there are non-trivial Wilson loops to compute. Um, but uh, I want to leave it basically at that for now and come back to this issue later on when discussing um, holographic delays. All right, so the next step then naturally is to try different representations of Wilson loops. Uh, and what I want to look at here is the K-fold anti-symmetric uh, representation. So I'm denoting this by this wedge uh, K here, and I want to take K uh, of order N. So this should be large in the large N limit. And for that case, actually there's a reason to expect that it's going to work better. Um, the reason is that here, the expectation value of the corresponding Wilson loop uh, is determined um, by the largest k distinct eigenvalues. And that means while some eigenvalues may run off to infinity, uh, almost all of them stay finite. Uh, and in terms of computations, it means that as I compute this factor 
uh, on the saddle point eigenvalue distribution, I may find divergencies, um, but they turn out to be integrable and I can compute the rules and lines. Um, and without much ado, uh, let me just jump straight into the results. Uh, the computation is somewhat non-trivial, but um, um, conceptually straightforward. Um, and leads to actually fairly uniform results for all the theories uh, I have introduced. So I'm introducing a funny k here to label, which runs between zero and one, and tells me what the representation is. I have the coordinate z on the quiver, which tells me what gauge node the Wilson loop is associated with. And in all cases, I find an exponential in which the argument has a quadratic scaling with the parameters that are large in the large hand limit. And then I have an appearance of the uh, bloch wigner dilogarithm function, which is um, a single valued and uh, real analytic, except for two points, uh, version of the uh, dilogarithm. Uh, and it has as an argument, some complex number, which encodes um, the gauge node I'm looking at and the representation I'm interested in. So this is now, more in the spirit of what I was uh, going after. It's a, it's a large set, a two-parameter family for each, um, for each gauge theory of Wilson lines, and I get exact predictions for the expectation values out of the localization calculations. Um, it's interesting that the, this bloch wigner function appears here, um, which has connections to many problems in, in various fields. In particular, it is related, uh, or it computes the volume of tetrahedra in hyperbolic space, um, which somehow makes one suspect that there may be some sort of geometric interpretation uh, for these localization calculations uh, that I have been uh, showing here. And um, that's basically what I want to conclude the field theory part with. I will come back a little bit to somewhat geometric questions regarding these results in the ADS-CFT part, um, but that's it for now. And let me move on and change gears. And I now want to switch basically to the ADS-CFT picture to get a complementary view on these results. And in the first step also, of course, confirm them so that one can uh, get some confidence in the results. So let me start by sort of outlining why we believe that these field theories that I have been um, introducing here have holographic duals. Sorry, why we believe that they make sense um, as quantum field theories, and then discuss the holographic duals. Um, one way to convince yourself that these theories make sense is that they can be engineered using uh, PQ5 brain webs and type 2D string theory. Um, a PQ5 brain web is a planar arrangement of PQ5 brains. Um, so in this example here, I'm showing 2D5 brains, which are suspended between NS5 brains. And as they join, the charges have to be conserved. So they form a 1,15 brain going out diagonally. And this brain web with the 2D5s suspended here uh, engineers for me uh, an SU2 gauge theory where the mass parameters of the gauge theory uh, are encoded in the length scales uh, in this brain web the horizontal and vertical extent of this face here encode the gauge coupling and the Coulomb branch um, parameter for this gauge theory. And I can now just take the limit where I collapse all the length scales in the web to zero so that I get this simpler looking intersection at a point. And that now engineers for me uh, the UV fixed point of this gauge theory on the intersection focus. So that's the reason why we believe in SU2 theory makes sense. I can uh, work in a similar way for uh, the theories I've been uh, looking at from the localization perspective. For the plus theory, I take an intersection of um, N D5 brains and M NS5 brains. Uh, in this case, I have four D5s and five NS5s. And sure enough, I find uh, an SU4, 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 um, the string of gauge nodes that I've been using here. And the flavors correspond to the semi-infinite five brains sticking out. Uh, west and east of the five brain web. And if I now collapse the um, brain web, um, all the length scales in there, I get an intersection at a point which has the shape of a plus and is the reason, of course, for the name for this theory. 
Uh, similarly, for the YN theory, I get the differently shaped um, brain web. I have an SE2, SE3, SE4, SE3, SE2. So it goes up and down as it was in the quiver diagram. It takes a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of, sorry, it is a little bit of an exercise um, to see that uh, these endpoints here correspond to two uh, uh, flavor hypermultiplets, but um, they do. And the, as I collapse this uh, web to an intersection at a point, I get something which has the shape of a Y and explains the name for this theory. And uh, last but not least, a um, similar story for the TN theory. I see SE2, SE3, and then four flavors at the end. And this is very much in line um, with the quiver diagram that I, I have introduced. All right, so the general picture is that every planar five brain junction at a point realizes a five dimensional superconformal field theory. On the intersection point, this theory is characterized by the five brain charges that play a role uh, in making up this intersection. Um, it may have uh, gauge theory deformations or it may not. And if it does, it can have multiple ones uh, related by dualities. So these are all interesting uh, questions to study um, and give sort of a top down picture for the bottom up version uh, where I started with the gauge theories. Uh, one can realize more general uh, theories by adding additional ingredients such as seven brains, um, but I will not uh, use those for the, need those for the theories um, that I picked out for the, uh, to talk about here. So let me just skip over it. Um, there's a natural large and limit now where I homogeneously take all the five brain charges that are involved in making up this interse intersection, uh, take them homogeneously large all of order some number n, and this naturally leads uh, to the large n limits of gauge theories that I have um, discussed for the three example theories. And in this large n limit, nicely enough, these, th these um, there are holographic duals for the field theories that are realized on this intersection point. And that's of course what I want to use to study Wilson lines. So let me briefly describe what the form of the holographic duals is. Uh, the general ansatz to describe sort of the near horizon limit uh, for these five brain junctions is that I certainly need an alias six to realize the conformal symmetry. I need an S2 for the R symmetry. And they can then both be uh, fibered or warped over a, Riemanns, a two dimensional Riemann surface that I call sigma. And uh, the general solution to the uh, BPS equations uh, upon imposing that we want 16 supersymmetries are then characterized um, by a pair of locally holomorphic functions, a plus minus on this Riemann surface. So the picture is for every choice of holomorphic functions, uh, I get a solution to type to be uh, supergravity in which I have an ADS6 with a radius given in terms of a plus minus and S2 with varying radius given by a plus in terms of a plus minus, a metric on the Riemann surface, there is a complex two form flux uh, complex two-form field and uh, non-trivial axidilaton, and they are all given in terms of these functions a plus minus. So any choice of these uh, holomorphic functions gives me an ADS6 solution in type 2b. Um, the equations of motion, BBS equations, don't restrict the choices that I get to make here, uh, but regularity conditions do, and they basically single out the physically sensible choices uh, of these Riemann sur of possible Riemann surfaces uh, and holomorphic functions. Now the regular solutions which we have in all case in, in all of those the uh, Riemann surface is a disk possibly with punctures um, and there are special points on the boundary of this disk where the differentials of these holomorphic functions have poles. They are characterized then by the residues uh, at these poles which I suggestively label by QI plus minus I, PI, and literally at these poles is where uh, PQ5 brains emerge uh, in the sense that the entire solution approaches that for flat five brains. And this gives a very clear identification of these solutions uh, with five brain junctions. If you're so inclined, you can add punctures into the interior of sigma uh, to represent seven brains, but again, that will not be required here. Um, and what we have now then are uh, ADS6 solutions that are very directly identified as near horizon limits of these five brain junctions and give me holographic duals for the superconformal field theories that are engineered 
uh, by the associated five-point junction. So now it's time to look at uh, back at our three examples for the plus theory. Uh, I'm instructed uh, to take a four-pole solution where I have uh, pairwise opposite equal residues, uh, two real ones for NS5 brains, two imaginary ones for D5 brains. Uh, for the YN theory, I'm instructed to look at a three-pole solution where I have NS5 residues and the 1,1 and 1,1 minus one residues. And likewise, um, for the TN theories, I have a three-pole solution, but with different residues uh, representing the different five-point charges that are involved in making this junction. So these are sort of is a schematic representation of the holographic duals. There are explicit expressions, of course, for all the uh, metric functions and fluxes and so forth. Um, but uh, let me just uh, jump straight into uh, looking at Wilson loops. If I want to realize um, uh, Wilson loops in these, or find Wilson loops in these solutions, uh, I should look for um, half BPS fundamental string embeddings uh, that have to wrap the ADS, an ADS2 part in ADS6. And by virtue of sort of the symmetries that they need to preserve, which is the entire SU2R symmetry, uh, they have to sit on the boundary of the Riemann surface. Uh, the reason is that on the boundary of these Riemann surface, on, of these disks, um, the S2 representing the R symmetry collapses. So at the boundary of the disk, I can have an, a fundamental string locally, located uh, at a point on the S2 without actually breaking the SU2R symmetry. Um, and in the field theory computation, we had this somewhat curiously scarce um, uh, Wilson loops in the fundamental representation, basically at all the nodes where the eigenvalue distributions had compact support is where I could compute it. And this is actually very well represented in the supergravity solutions by a similar sparse set of supersymmetric string embeddings. For the plus solutions, I can only have fundamental strings directly sitting on the D5 poles. Uh, they produce a trivial expectation value. The, the on-shell action vanishes uh, in line with the field theory computation. Likewise, for the TN theory, the fundamental string has to sit on the D5 pole and I reproduce the field theory result. Uh, the only interesting case was the YN theory. In that case, indeed, I find the fundamental string sitting sort of halfway in between these two poles here. And the expectation value is an exact agreement with the leading order scaling of the field theory result for the expectation value. So at least um, as far as the computation goes, uh, this is a perfect agreement between the ADS CFT um, um, picture and the field theory computation. And we can then, as before, move on. Um, but before moving on, um, let me just mention that, of course, now with the ADS CFT duals in hand, I can study more general line operators, uh, non perturbative line operators that involve uh, D strings, uh, likely corresponding to some uh, instanton line operators in the gauge theory, uh, or more general PQ strings. Um, these are not as easily accessible in the gauge theories, but can be uh, studied um, by using uh, dualities between gauge theories. But that I just wanted to mention as a side note here. Okay, but now um, let me move on uh, to the anti-symmetric representation, uh, in which case we had much um, more plentiful results. Uh, a natural candidate for the Wilson lines in the uh, anti-symmetric representation, just based on the scaling, is um, uh, the three brain. Uh, and based on the symmetries it needs to preserve, it has to wrap again ADS2 inside of ADS6, and it has to wrap the entire two sphere that represents the R symmetry in the holographic solutions. Uh, it can have electric and magnetic flux on it, uh, corresponding to fundamental string and d-string charge, uh, and there is a non-trivial West Semino to the two-form field in the background. So there are a number of knobs one can twist and turn, and altogether this leads to a very rich spectrum of D3 brains in the solutions. I get basically one supersymmetric D3 brain at each point of the Riemann surface. Um, all I have to do is choose the fluxes as dictated by supersymmetry. So that's very promising. We have a large set um, of D3 brains and then I get one for each point in sigma actually makes a lot of sense from the brain web picture. If I start with the one sitting in the center here, um, it's 
basically clear that this corresponds to a D3 brain in the brain web sitting in the central node. And as I move now horizontally see, along the diameter of the disc, um, the, the fundamental string charge on the brain changes, and this corresponds to moving horizontally in the associated brain web. Uh, likewise, if I move vertically along this vertical diameter, the D1 charge changes on the D3, and that corresponds to vertically moving in the brain web. Um, and um, this way, sort of the fundamental and D-string charges on the D3 brain put the coordinate system on the Riemann surface, which associates with each point a face in the brain web that the solution represents. Uh, in terms of Wilson lines, it's clear that the horizontal location of the D3 brain corresponds to what gauge node the Wilson loop is associated with, while the vertical position of the D3 brain uh, encodes the representation that it's in. Uh, this can be seen by pulling the D3 brain out of the brain web um, off to infinity. And in that process, if I cross KD5 brains, I uh, create, I get a string creation between them uh, through these Hermione Witten transitions. Uh, I create K fundamental strings between the D3 brain and various um, D5 brains. So I get the K fold tensor product representation. And these strings are constrained by the S rule, which makes it uh, into an anti symmetric representation. So this is exactly what we had in the field theory. And I can then compute uh, the Wilson loop uh, from the D3 brain action in a fairly straightforward manner. Um, it's a bit of a complicated expression and needs some massaging. Uh, but at the end of the day, I find uh, analytically the exact same results for the expectation values that I had previously shown you from the gauge theory computation. Um, this is literally the same slide as I had before, but um, be assured that these are two independent computations um, and gives an analytic match to the localization um, uh, results. Of course, the comments that one can make on the form of these expectation values uh, are identical with the ones that are made in the gauge theory computations. Since it's the same result, there's not much more to say here. Um, what is new though is that um, from the SL2Z body of type 2B, um, I can reveal many hidden relations uh, between these results for different theories and symmetries of the results for one theory. For example, for the plus theory, it may not be entirely obvious that this expression is actually invariant under exchanging K, the representation, with the gauge node label Z, both of which run between zero and one. And this is um, a simple consequence of S duality uh, in type 2B. There are some more things which one could discuss, but um, I want to come back to something which is uh, somewhat exciting, uh, and that's geometric interpretations. Uh, for these um, computations. I don't quite have something to say on um, the relation of this bloch wigner function to, um, um, to the volume of tetrahedra, but there is a very direct connection to the geometry of the supergravity solution. In a sense, these anti-symmetric Wilson loops computed through D3 brains uh, go straight to the core of the ADS6 solutions that I used um, to study the field theories. Uh, and the point is that uh, the D3 brain action, which has many moving parts to it uh, by the wonders of uh, supersymmetry, at the end of the day reduces to one particular function of the holomorphic functions A plus minus that characterize any given ADS6 supergravity solution in type 2B. And this particular function G uh, happens to feature very prominently in the construction of the solutions. namely the entire geometry of the solutions is determined solely by this function G and its derivatives. Um, I'm giving the explicit expression here um, just to sort of prove the point. The entire uh, um, set of metric functions, the ADS6 radius, the S2 radius, the metric non sigma, are all expressed in terms of G. And this G in turn has uh, an explicit expression in terms of the functions of plus and minus, which is a bit, um, uh, involved, so I won't review it here. Um, but the point is that the D3 brains representing anti-symmetric Wilson loops directly are given by this function G. 
So in terms of the gauge theory perspective, um, this gives a very important piece uh, in the construction of the supergravity solutions out of a gauge theory computation. And it would certainly be quite amusing if at the end of the day, uh, one could construct um, the complete ADS6 solutions um, out of gauge theory computations uh, of Wilson loops and perhaps some additional input um, that is needed. Okay, I think that's um, most of what I wanted to say here. Uh, let me sum up. I've um, shown exact results for a fairly general and large class of half BBS Wilson loops um, for arbitrary gauge nodes in a sample of long curve gauge theories uh, that have holographic duals in type uh, 2b. The results are confirmed by ADS CFT, so one can uh, have some confidence that they're actually that they actually make sense. Uh, and this leads to some interesting uh, questions for the future, perhaps. It would certainly be interesting to study the defect CFTs on the Wilson lines, um, get some ADS2 CFT1 duralities out of it uh, along the lines of what has been done uh, with Wilson loops in N equals four super young mills. Um, it would similarly be interesting to think of perhaps about bubbling solutions. Uh, in these five dimensional theories, the uh, the free energy has a very steep scaling. We saw the n to the four for all the examples that I have discussed. Uh, so this allows for fairly large representation Wilson loops uh, without having to worry about back reaction, but there are limits and it would be interesting uh, to think about uh, what happens as you go beyond that limit. And finally, of course, one can think about more general line operators, more general field theories, and there are other types of more general supergravity solutions, which I have discussed. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I've uh, I've learned that so somewhere in the uh, controls on Zoom there's a there's an applause button. I've forgotten where it is, um, but I'm, I'm sure everyone is uh, in spirit uh, uh, giving you the traditional applause at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you um, for your really excellent seminar. Um, and uh, I think we can now try and take questions. As I said, uh, people can uh, attempt to just sort of jump in or unmute yourself and ask a question. Or if you prefer, type something into the uh, chat window, which um, I think uh, uh, by default communicates with everyone. So, are there any questions? Could, could I ask something? No, oh, yeah. Sure. Hi, hey, Carlos. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? Uh, well, first of all, thanks very much for the, the very nice seminar. Uh, let me ask you something from the beginning. So, these are basically two questions. One is from the beginning of the talk, the other is from nearly the end of the talk. In the beginning of the talk, you discuss quivers that have almost all nodes, these were your words, with NF equals to two and C, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and then you discuss quivers of interest where this function that you describe as rank function was always concave, yeah? So mm -hmm. the question is, yes. in, in other dimensions, I know what's the justification for that is either anomalies or beta functions equal to zero. Mm -hmm. in, in this case, what's the reason for this, um, for constraining to theories like these ones? Very good. Um, yeah, the reason is that, um, um, well, there's a long history to that and then revisions, but um, the reason is uh, for a gauge theory to have a UV fixed point, uh, the first question you want to ask is, does it make sense as an effective field theory on its Coulomb branch? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at this carefully, you find that um, there are constraints on how many flavors you can have um, without spoiling the existence of a UV fixed point. Uh, so these um, um, are, the, are not constraints from, from, from anomalies, but they are constraints uh, from the requirement for this gauge theory to flow to a, a UV fixed, to a, to a well-defined UV fixed point uh, eventually. And that uh, constraints, for example, um, for, for these SUN nodes, the number of flavors um, to be no more than 2N. Uh, there are exceptions to that, but it seems that for uh, these quiver gauge theories, 
actually the number is really bounded by 2n. Um, it doesn't have to saturate it, so that's something which is somewhat different. That's why you can have this, um, these concave shapes. But it's really the flavor bounds which ensure that the theory has a UV fixed point. Okay. The, the question from the very end of the talk is that using, using the, the metrics you constructed, you were able to reproduce this special function, you call it block, block Bigner function, the, the D function. Yeah. So mm -hmm. where, where, where is it encoded? This function, where is it? Is it in the complex functions that you use to define the background in integrals of it? How, how it appears? Absolutely. Absolutely. It appears. Um, so I have, let me go to the point here. Um, so each of these solutions is characterized by a pair of holomorphic functions. Mm -hmm. And I was um, sort of, I snuck it in a little bit um, that these, the differentials of these holomorphic functions um, have poles on the boundary and residues. So the holomorphic functions themselves or locally holomorphic functions themselves are sums of logarithms. Mm -hmm. And then this function uh, curly G, which actually gives me um, the, uh, the, the, the three brain on shell action uh, is constructed from integrals of combinations of these A plus minus functions. And that's how you get the logarithms into the picture. I see. I see. Thanks very much. This is in, in line, by the way, um, with the results for the uh, sphere partition functions where you have probably spotted um, that there are zeta functions appearing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, those uh, okay. come also from evaluating uh, poly logarithms at special points. Um, I've chosen, deliberately chosen simple examples here. In general, you will get some combination of poly logarithms in the, in the sphere partition functions, especially for solutions which have seven brains uh, to them. So they also show up um, in the, uh, in the, in the um, free energies. Thanks very much. Uh, perhaps another question? Yeah, can I ask a question? Hi, Oren. Sure. Hi, Oren. Hi, Chris. How are you? <laughs> so, I probably asked you this in January, but that seems like such a long time ago now. <laughs> So, um, can you apply this uh, method of taking a continuum limit of the quiver uh, to uh, 60 long quivers in six dimensions, which have known uh, ADS7 duals? Um, I wouldn't see why not. Uh, the question is what one wants to compute with it, I suppose. S6 free energy, I guess. For one. Um, but isn't it uh, in 60 that the uh, gauge uh, theory only captures part of the uh, degrees of freedom? So I'm not sure um, whether I get all the way. But Thank certainly, you, I mean, this long. Oh, sorry. No, go Hi, ahead. Fabio. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, I just was going to say that uh, certainly I think the, the, this way of doing the localization calculations should be um, applicable in, in, in various other dimensions as well. And that's something which would be interesting to look at. <laughs> yeah, I have a related question to Oren's question. Uh, so what happens if you uh, do your localization computation with a, with a gauge theory that actually uplifts to a 60 theory? Yeah. If you, um, if you have the YM theory, right? That actually uplifts to a 60 theory. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, very good. Um, I actually thought about that at some point. Um, and I think. Um, I, I would have to think about it. I, I think. Um, it, so the um, uh, there is some conspiracy going on uh, for this. You get this electrostatics problem in which um, flavors show up as point charges uh, and in the form of boundary conditions. 
And there are some uh, conditions on getting out um, a potential which is positive as you would want for an eigenvalue distribution. Uh, and that requires some conspiracy between the um, data that characterizes the quiver. Um, my guess would be that this is the first place to look um, for what changes. I'm not sure I have something sharper to say than that at the moment. Yeah, do you expect the large end behavior to change? There are cancellations in the, in the matrix model. Um, so there is some room for that, perhaps. Um, yeah. Well, for that, I, I mean, you should get an end, for, an end to the fifth behavior somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's sort of what the leading, yeah. it's not impossible. <laughs> okay, thanks. Any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one one question, a uh, follow up of what Fabio approximately asked, uh, would be this: um, these theories that Fabio mentions, they could be uplifted to six dimensions. Will they will they be six dimensional one comma zero conformal theories? Yeah, this is sort of the line along which um, the thought actually went. Uh, so the flavor bounds, which guarantee that you get a fixed point in five D, when you mm -hmm. saturate them, uh, you mm -hmm. tend to flow to sixty, and um, that sort of uh, changes the form of this um, in the localization calculation. It is reflected in the form of this electrostatics potential. And I think one would want to take a look at what happens to it as I go away from theories which have a 5D fixed point. Good, good. But then you would, would you then think that the, the backgrounds you wrote, they should somewhat connect with the backgrounds that Fabio wrote with, with Tomasiello? Mm -hmm. Would you expect Yeah, that? exactly. Okay. Exactly. I mean, the the um, for for the holographic duals, that would be um, um, yeah, a, a different story. Uh, also, mm -hmm. it, it would be interesting to see how whether this can be made to work and how. Um, certainly. Yeah. Um, Thank you. You could speculate that maybe. Um, Okay, let me say this. There is a somewhat, um, there seems to be a somewhat close connection as we have seen uh, between these localization computations and the form of the supergravity. Um, dual, uh, another piece of information that I can tell is that this function curly g, which came out of the, uh, of the D3 brain calculation, uh, which plays a role in the supergravity solutions. Uh, is constrained by regularity conditions to be uh, positive in the interior of the Riemann surface and to vanish on the boundaries. And this translates uh, to getting a well-defined expectation value for the Wilson loop, which sort of vanishes as I dial the size of the representation to zero. Um, and one could wonder whether, you know, sort of relaxing regularity conditions and allowing for more general electrostatics problem in the localization computations, whether there are some correspondence between these two aspects uh, in the supergravity side and the field theory side. That would be interesting to understand, I think. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, sure, I'll ask a question. Go for it. Um, so in your um, PQ web picture, it seems really easy if you just want to generate a different representation rather than the anti-symmetric Wilson loops to just put more D3 brains. And then you'd get some kind of tensor products of the representations you're discussing. Have you looked at that at all? Um, not yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, you like can symmetric ask representation. For... My expectation for symmetric would be that um, for as long 
as you stay uh, with small enough representations that they don't back react on the saddle point configurations that you run into the same problem as with the fundamental representation. Um, the reason being, again, uh, that these eigenvalue distributions have um, uh, unbounded support for, for most nodes. So for symmetric representations, the story will be somewhat more constrained in a similar way uh, to what it was for the fundamental loops. Okay, thanks. Questions? Okay, well, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's time to wrap this up. Um, let me say once again, thank you very much, Christoph, for an e excellent seminar. I found the uh, I found the reaction button, uh, so I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna click mine and uh, <laughs> uh, oh no, there's claps. So uh, anyway, this work this <laughs> thank work you extremely, very much. Very good. Others have found those as well. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hope everything is uh, good with you in Michigan. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us. And look out for more uh, seminars um, from USC. <laughs> <laughs>